Well, we've been leading up to this in our sermons uh, the last few weeks, preaching on the different events that happened up to the point of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And uh, today we come to the apex. The reason we're here, the reason we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're going to be opening our Bibles today, Luke chapter 23, verse 44. Um, I'm going to be actually preaching from two sets of scriptures today, uh, in Luke 23 and Luke 24. But we're going to begin with Luke 23, verse 44. And then while you're at it, you may want to turn your Bible over to Luke 24, verse 36. Does anyone need a Bible? Actually, it's probably right on the next page. Does anyone need a Bible? Anybody need a Bible? Anyone need a Bible? Please raise your hand. Praise the Lord. I got it. God is good. You all there? Father God, I come before you, Lord. Once again, to preach your word. Lord, I don't take this for granted, Lord. And, uh, I'm humble with this responsibility, Lord, this blessing, this gift, Lord God. Holy Spirit, I just thank you living inside me. Thank you for guiding me, for strengthening me. And I'm going to ask you now to speak to me, to guide my mind, to guide my heart, to be the words in my mouth that come off of my tongue. And that, and that Holy Spirit, you prepare the hearts of this congregation, Father, to receive the word of this oh-so-glorious of messages. Mm -hmm. The, the most important message. He's alive. Yes. So can you. I ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Luke chapter 23, verse 44. We're going to go through 49. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man is innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all, this, all his acquaintances and, and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and watched these things. Now we're going to turn quickly over to uh, Luke 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus stood among them and said unto them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is my, I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? <laughs> they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. You know, I'm reading this, and I just want to stop here for a second. You know, you read this, you can read this a hundred times, and then all of a sudden you see something you've never noticed before. And that is, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, I mean, what a profound statement. They couldn't, they, they couldn't believe their eyes, yet they were joy, you know, rejoicing in his appearance. He, there he is, and I still don't believe you here. I can't believe it. Amen? Let me go on. Have you anything here to eat? Verse 42. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms 
must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Amen. Amen. So from noon to 3 p.m. on that day, it was Friday, um, there was darkness. And you have to ask yourself, was it a solar eclipse? Was it that the moon had gone over the sun like we see so common um, in our lives? You know, like a few years we had an eclipse. Um, was that what he was talking about? I don't think so. Because it got dark. It was dark outside. You know, I've seen solar eclipses before. It's more like dust. It's not dark. It's not like the apex of darkness. But all I do know is this, that God made it happen. It was a sovereign move of our Lord, accomplishing something that they still didn't really understand. They still didn't fully grasp. Darkness had reached its apex. The wrath of God poured out on Christ. There could be no darker time in space or in history. God had turned his back on the sun. Messiah, our Redeemer. There is no hope. All is lost. Darkness. You recall in the scriptures I just read when they left, they went doing what uh, Jewish people would do in times of utter despair and loss. They go home beating their breasts. Mm. This was not a win, this was a loss. Mistakenly, but it is what it is. We don't want to. Mm gloss over that. It was a time of great loss for all those who believed in Jesus Christ. Imagine the feeling Satan must have had. Think about it for a second. All this is happening and he's looking and he's going glory to me. Praise me. I have killed the second Adam. I have killed Adam again. I beat you, Yahweh. Hmm. Who are you now? Ha ha! Think about it. He wasn't sitting there going, this is very good. No, I'm sure, he was rejoicing. As he said in Ezekiel, as it said about him in Ezekiel 28, verse 9, I am the, the true God. I am coming, Yahweh, coming to heaven to set my throne up higher than yours. Higher than yours could ever be. You will be the one who says, Oh, how I wish I could be like Lucifer. That comes from Isaiah 14, verses 13 to 14. You know, we, we tend to apply this, this uh, sobriety and this piety to the Bible when we read so many things. But think about what Lucifer was feeling that day. He knew who Adam was, that Adam was not the Christ. Adam was not the only begotten son, so when he defeated Adam, it was a victory, right? But now he defeated the very son of God. He defeated the second member of the triune God. And just as Jesus on the cross said, it is finished, to what sounded like a, uh, a clarion call of defeat, the words of victory in the ears of Satan that must have brought Great joy, great satisfaction to him. He had his revenge. Jesus shouts out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. Now those witnessing these events in Calvary, at Calvary on, the, on Golgotha, they didn't realize it. But at that very moment, in Jerusalem, at the temple, what was going on? Well, the earth was quaking, in and around Jerusalem, there were uh, tombs blowing open right. and people coming out and walking. Right? 
But what was going on inside the temple? Yeah. The veil separating the Holy of Holies from the holy place was being torn from the top, top to the down. And imagine being a priest in the temple while this is happening. Maybe it was your day to be inside and lighting and, and make sure the candles are lit and, and replacing when you have to and putting the oil in and, and bringing the showbread in and, and you're setting everything's up and, and you're throwing more incense onto the altar of incense and just making sure it's all good. But all of a sudden, it all starts shaking. And then, from what I understand, this curtain was like six inches thick. Right? And it was without a seam. It was just a wall of curtain, fabric. Top down. You can bet that priest tore out of there as fast as he could. Right? A lot of uh, fantastic things going on. And, and, you know, for many, these um, things that are happening are, are uh, misunderstood. You know, for the people going home, the, 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 the believers, for Jesus' mom, Mary, you know, they're, they're hurting right now. You know, they're seeing all these things as like the accumulation of what all their dreams being dashed. They didn't understand. What could it mean? The priest seeing this happen inside the Holy of Holies, uh, the holy place, and, and seeing what would happen if, if, if it wasn't the Day of Atonement and a priest was standing in and went into um, the Holy of Holies. What would happen to the priest? He would die. So here he is, he's minding his business, doing what he's got to do, and the curtain rips, and he's staring he's at the Ark of the Covenant. I promise you, he ran. He ran it. Inside the city, the tombs were exploding. Dead bodies began to walk. Very little is known about these souls, who they were, and why they rose. Not all the dead rose, just some. There is no record of how this was handled by the people. But I think I could guess how it was handled by the people. Mm. What do you think? They were freaking out. Yeah. It was going to the dead, right? A stick to the brain? Huh? A stick to the brain or something? A stick to the brain, I hope not. But, uh, you know, I mean, these were supernatural things going on. These are things that are not seen. These are things that have not been seen since 400 years before in the time of the Old Testament prophets who were still performing these miracles, right? We have so many years of nothing happening, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes. And, and the Old Testament miracles are all, are all happening again, but even in a greater way. It all seemed that, yes, Satan had beaten God to the people again. And at the very least, God was very, very angry at that moment. And this all happened on Friday morning through afternoon around 3 p.m. The Sabbath was to begin shortly at sunset, and it was Passover. Joseph of Arimathea rushed to Pilate for permission to take his body down so that Jesus could be at rest in his tomb before sunset when the Sabbath would formally begin. And then on Sunday morning, the tomb is discovered empty. Adding insult to injury, Right? Because we're still not receiving things quite the way we should be. We're not understanding really the, the, what the prophets had said, what Jesus had said fully as his believers. Right? All this loss has happened. Now Sunday rolls around, and, and they go to the tomb, and the rock's there, and his body's gone. Right? And an insult to injury, if, you, if I may. There are reports of angelic visitation. But that happened to some women. And who can be sure they weren't just imagining this? Right? Because they had to go back and report. They saw the angels. The angels said, he's risen. They're like, they're, they're amazed. And they're running off. And he says, go tell the apostles. And they go to tell the apostles. And they're like, really? And then they took Peter and uh, John take off for the tomb to see for themselves. You know, you got to look at these things and think about, remember, they're humans. 
What would their humanity do? How would they react? He's in real eyes. We see his body's gone. We saw these two angels and they said, Wow, she's lost it. Right? I remember when, I know you don't like when I do this, but, and you know exactly what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> when, uh, when we had a house on Long Island and uh, we had, I don't know how many dogs we had at that two. point, two. And uh, Sandy, my dog, Jordan Shepherd, uh, we had gone away on a vacation, which was right after 9 11. And uh, when we came back, my nephew told me that she had run away. And for three days, was it three days? Rain, and we're out there looking for my dog. I was heartbroken. Yeah. And, uh, I'm handing out bulbs, you know, flyers to people pulling my eyes out, saying, See my dog, you know, and uh, it still makes me cry. But um, yeah. one night, I couldn't sleep, and I went down to the living room, and um, I see Nancy, I'm, I'm not sleeping, I'm on the couch, and then I see Nancy come downstairs, and she goes to the back door, and she goes, Sandy, Sandy, it's like one o'clock in the morning, and I'm watching her, I'm going, man, she's lost it, and now she's yelling out the back door, all of a sudden she goes, she's here, she's here, and Sandy comes running in the house, you know, and, oh my goodness, but, wow. but I'm thinking of those thoughts I had, those seconds before I saw Sandy, she's lost it, man, you know, Humanity, we have human emotions, you know, we have human reactions. Luke 24, verse 11 says, But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. I rest my face. A little later on, Sunday evening, Jesus appeared to the disciples in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. In spite of this visitation and commissioning to go out and preach the gospel, the apostles are still not yet clear on what is happening and are still doubting. How do I know this? How do you know this, Pastor Chris? Well, Peter himself uttered the famous words from John chapter 21, verse 3. Anyone know off the top of your head? Going fishing. Going fishing. <laughs> Going fishing. What does that mean? So he's going fishing. He was a fisherman. Exactly. Peter is, is making a declaration that he has lost faith to the degree that he's now going to go back to what he was doing. He's going to go fishing for fish instead of men. And at that time, when this happened, um, what do I have written? He, he wasn't alone. He was with other um, of the apostles and disciples, which I can't find, but that's fine. He's declaring both his unbelief and what might become his walking away from his calling and going back into the world. Mm -hmm. Resuming this worldly vocation as if none of this Jesus stuff ever really happened. Or wasn't really what it looked like it was going to be. He still, this is after he saw the Lord once. And he's still not sold out on the fact that Jesus is alive. And the same goes for our good friend, Thomas, the apostle, good old doubting Thomas. Well, if I don't see him and get to put my fingers in his wounds, I, you wouldn't catch me sticking my fingers in my wounds, <laughs> right? But if I don't do that, I will not believe. And, and you know, you think of all the times when Jesus was, was walking and talking and with the apostles and teaching them, and they would say these really dumb things. <laughs> And you, you, there are times you read the Bible and, and you put it down. You go, you know, Jesus. We we're talking about it yesterday. He, you know, did the head smack <laughs> exist back then? And you'd be like, how long must I put up with you guys? <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, human nature. You know, it's our 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 human flesh. You could even call it a, a part of the curse that causes our faith to to just dissipate real fast and for us to automatically grab, uh, gravitate towards the natural. It's gone. I thought he was going to be King David. I thought he was going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. I thought the Romans were going to be kicked out. I thought that Jesus, as I said last week, would be the new Caesar. King of the world, not just king of Jerusalem. The kingdom of God. And there he is on a cross. It was Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, and John, and two other disciples who were fishing. But what happens when they go official? <laughs> Christ comes back again. He visits them again. And he restores Peter, those famous 
to me, some of the most um, uh, relatable verses in my Christian walk, in my salvation experience, when Christ tells Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? You betrayed me three times. People asked me about, asked you about me three times, and three times you denied me. You know, in our lives, it doesn't have to be you saying to someone, I deny Christ. I was, I was not with him. We, we do that in our actions. We do that in how we act towards others and how we act towards people in our lives, how we act towards our loved ones, how we act towards the world who is looking at us to see if we're Christians or to see if we're just going to fall in line like the rest of them. You know, these are all denials. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Ken? Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Lord? Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Chris? Feed my sheep. You see, he's not just talking to the pastors. He's talking to everyone. You have no idea who's out there who are his sheep and have yet to come to him to the fall. You have no idea how many people you might share your faith with who despise you, reject you, spit at you, curse you, make fun of you, family, friends. Which one of them are actually going to be saved? A year down the line, five years down the line, ten years down the line, maybe on your deathbed. They're your brother and sister. You just don't see it as that. Feed my sheep. He restored Jesus that day. And he restores you today. Why? That once again, you would speak into the lives of others the truths of the gospel. And not only would you speak the words of salvation, of eternal life, into the lives of people, but that you would walk the words of eternal life Amen. into the life of people. I am not one of those, you know, Francis of Sisi's uh, credited with these words, you know, uh, share the gospel every day when necessary, use words. I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I think that's a copy. I understand the inner thing it's saying. You need to be walking the walk. But I say do both. I say that if you are doing the one, you know, you can do good deeds so that the cows come home, the person you're doing good deeds for go to hell when they die. You need to share the gospel. Christ did, right? Don't tell me Christ can share the gospel. He's our example. We talked about hell many, many times in the end. Uh, just really did not hold back in, in why people need to come to Christ, you know? It's just very, very important. You're called to be the salt. You're called to be the light, just as Peter was. And then we arrive at our other set of primary scriptures for today, um, Luke 24, 36 to 49. And in verse 36 of Luke chapter 24, it says, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them, and said to them, Peace to you. He says, Peace to you. He says, Peace to you, Nate. He says, Peace to you, Sue. He says, Peace to you, Lori and Ricky. Peace to you. How long will you live your life as a believer without that peace, that, that all sustaining, all ever abiding peace that no matter what gets thrown at you in this life? You have Jesus. Jesus is my peace. Amen? Amen. He came to bring peace between you and the Father. He came to calm the storms inside of you. He came to calm your anger. He came to take away your unforgiveness. He came to heal your bitterness. He came to pour the sugar of the Holy Spirit on top of your bitterness. came to touch you in your bereavement, the loss. You know, we, we, uh, we suffer many losses in our lives, and many, many times the suffering of those losses uh, walk with us throughout our lives and affect how we think, how we act, how we talk, who we'll be with, how we'll deal with others. He came to heal us in bereavement. What is your loss? Is it youth? 
Christian innocence? Was it um, seeing the best in others first? You know, I was a private investigator for 13 years, and when I left, I had the burnt out cop syndrome. Mm. I couldn't look at anybody without trying to figure out what your angle is. What's your angle? 13 years, I was a PI. And finally, I, you know, one of the main reasons I stepped away and said, I'm not doing this anymore, is because I stopped looking at people as good. Instead, I kept looking at people as liars, mm. as uh, people with guile, right? What's their, what's their angle, man? I got to think, because when I was a PI, I always had to figure out the angle. Figure out the angle, you figure out the truth. He came to deliver us, heal us of the uncontrollable emotions and desires that we suffer from as a result of our experience in our lives before Christ. And he rose again. He is still risen, and he is still alive. Grace lives. Yes. Grace wins. Yes. Yes. You see, in grace, we have that power to overcome all these things. We have the healing. You know, it's not even like we have to overcome them. We already have them. We just need to start embracing them and, and taking them and saying, you know what, I'm feeling this today, but I'm declaring in the name of Jesus Christ that I am this enemy. The Lord rebuke you. Verse 38 and 39 of chapter 24. Now the disciples had the benefit of feeling the flesh of the risen Christ. What does Jesus have to say about that? Right? He appears. Look, my hands, my feet. Thomas says, give me a hand. Stick it in. Look. Right? In John chapter 20, verse 29, it says this. Jesus said to them, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. You know, Christ is, is very pragmatic. You know, um, I could I could whistle sweet songs to you about how you would, you know, when, when you come to Christ, brother, he's always with you. When those times are, are really rough, oh, he's there with you, brother. You just got to have faith. But you know what? Let's be real. I know in my walk, in my life, there have been times where I have felt alone and abandoned. Where I have felt like, you know, where is, oh, that I could be back in those days when Christ was walking and, and I, could, I, could be, I could sit with him a while. I could sing, right? If I could just sit with you a while, I need you to hold me. He knows. And brother, sister, your faith, he looks at your faith. The angels look down and see your faith in the midst of that. all those feelings. The bad things that are going on in your life, the hurts, the past uh, exper painful experiences, and your desire to be healed of them, and you just can't do it. But I am going to hold on. I am not going to forsake my Lord. And the angels are looking down at you in that moment. They're going, glory to God. I don't know that I can do that. Right? It's something that's never been seen in eternity. What Christ has done. What Christ has provided for, for you and for me. That you would remain faithful even though you do not have the benefit of being able to touch Jesus in the flesh is a great testimony to the genuineness of your faith. Always remember that. Christ sees it that way. I mean, yeah, you, you should press in. Yeah, get to your word, maybe, you know? Yeah, uh, contact a brother or sister and, and let them speak to you and, and, and counsel you. They may even rebuke you in love. But realize that Christ looks down at that faith that's struggling to hold on and holding on as something very, very special. Also, Jesus had flesh and bone. In his eternal body. You wonder, what's it going to be like in eternity? You know, well, I mean, I know that when I die, you know, my soul will go to the ward, my body will go into the ground. So what does that tell you? You will have a spirit in heaven. You will not have a body. You may have a form of a body, but you will not have flesh and bones. They're in the ground. And the day will come when he resurrects, you will be reunited 
and then we will have, see that your body, that's what you're going to have. It's just going to, it's going to have no curse. Amen. Now how that's going to change how I look, how you look, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not going to be the same, but it is going to be the same. It's going to be the way it was always, 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 always intended for it to be. His grace to his beloved also has provided that we too shall have flesh and bone bodies for eternity. They don't get old. They don't get fat. They don't, you know, they just glory because of his grace. Because of what Jesus provided. Verse 41 to 43. While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. He's got a sense of humor. I like that verse. Right? He's showing us that he can eat and enjoy food in his eternal flesh body. Can you imagine? They're like, <laughs> Right? Grace has also provided that we should enjoy food and drink and the fellowship of the brotherhood of saints for all eternity. Amen. Verse 44, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, the first thing grace is showing us is all this will likely be fulfilled. Could be fulfilled. Will be fulfilled. Trust my word is what he's saying. Trust my word. I don't care how things look. We have to stop seeing with our natural eyes what our reality is and start seeing with eternal eyes of what our reality is. Or, um, okay, because you know, none of us have arrived. But what our reality truly is coming into. What we are destined for. So, you know, take courage. <coughs> take, take comfort from it. <clears throat> Whatever it is you're feeling now. Now, I'm not minimizing the call to holiness, the call to lean into Christ. But I'm not going to minimize your pain or your sufferings or your pasts. Realize it's not the future. The day you got born again, that all became something of the past. You've got so much more to look forward to. You've got so much to look forward to that the Bible can't even explain. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Okay? Jesus has fulfilled Torah. Jesus has fulfilled Torah. Amen. Let me put that to another way. Jesus has fulfilled the law. Every time in the Bible, in the New Testament, you read law, but in Torah, because that's the word. Right? It is not obliterated. <coughs> Gone. It's fulfilled. It is fulfilled. Well, what do you mean? Glad you asked. <laughs> Strong says this. Fulfilled. To make replete. What does that mean? I had to look that up, too. That is literally to cram a net. To level up a hollow, right? Anyone who bakes knows what this is. Yeah. You're leveling off the measuring cup, right? I'm going to get yelled at for having coffee. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, to satisfy, to execute, to finish a period or task, to accomplish, to complete, to completely fill. To end, expire, fill up, fulfill. All of these things are speaking about if the law was this cup and its use of the law, it has all been crammed in that you can't get any more in. You see, in the fullness of time, Christ came. Now, what his um, standard was, or his criteria of what that was, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. We'll have to ask Jesus when we see him. Ask the Father and the what was it about that date that you said, Jesus, go? I mean, think about that. They're all up in heaven. You know, the Lamb of God, the Holy Spirit, they're all up there. And the angels are all around. And the angel's like, something big's going to happen. Something big's going to happen. Something big's going to happen. And Jesus is looking at the Father, and all of a sudden the Father goes, go. To Mary. Right? 
Holy Spirit. Just what? What? Not the plan of God to rest in us. It sounds like that in being fulfilled, there is no longer any room for Torah, for the law, in the sense of its purpose, which is to reveal and expose sin and then condemn us to hell, to death, and to hell. That's the reason we have law. Right? But let's be very careful here because that's not quite what it means. Jesus also tells us, right, he used all the scriptures. In Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So the law still has a function. It still exists. You see, for those who reject Christ and His grace, the law still reveals sin, punishment, and condemns to death and hell. But for the born-again believer, for his beloved bride, for those who have turned to him and pleaded with him, save me, I'm a sinner, and if, and if you sent me to hell, you'd be just. But I'm asking you to save me. I repent. It means I turn back to God. Now, because I turn back to God, all well, the things that I'm doing over here, I'm turning away from. <coughs> To those, there is no law, but there is no sin imputed. There is no death. He took the penalty. The law was satisfied. You know, I was, I was thinking about this, and I'm thinking about, you know, we are Abrahamic. We are in the Abrahamic covenant. We're not in the Mosaic covenant. And, you know, when you look back at Moses and Sarah and uh, not Moses, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. And you look at these guys, were they perfect? No, no they were schemers. I mean, Abraham twice sold his wife off almost, right? Well, did God kick him out of the covenant? No. You know why? There's no law. There's no law. When Jacob did the things he did, he didn't get kicked out of the covenant. No law. That's the way it is for you and for I, brothers and sisters. The worst thing you could do is take that concept and say, praise God, no law. I'm going to continue smoking crack. I'm going to continue billing too much at work. I'm going to continue seeing that other woman or other man. I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue. No. Once you do that, you've now perverted the gospel of grace. But mark my words. Your sin is not imputed to you. So whether you're a, a, a murderous bank robber or just some dude who looks at porn once in a while, you're both, now you need to repent, all right? But in grace, there is no more penalty. You're going to reap it yourself, trust me. But there is, it's not a heaven or hell issue. What's, the only way I can explain this to you, the best way I can explain this to you is if your eyes are on God. If you've truly, see, if I don't repent, and God's over there, and I don't repent, where are my eyes? Where's my heart facing? No way. But once I repent, and I turn to God, now my eyes are on my Lord, and my heart is towards my Lord. You know, I'm going to make mistakes. I still, I still might lie once and get caught, or not get caught, so I'm going to get caught in here. I still might do this, or I still might do that, Lord, but I'm still looking at you, and I'm going to walk forward again. He loves me, and He wants me to succeed. God does not want you to fail. He has risen. Hallelujah. Because He has risen, you too can have that victory. Yep. I'm not just talking about the victory that says, in spite of your sin, you're going to go to heaven. I'm talking about the victory that says, you can overcome it. He is making you into His own image right now. Yes. The risen Lord. That's right. Thank you, man, right? Just amazed. He took my penalty. He took your penalty. The law was satisfied on your behalf because of his act. And now there's no more law. As far as it's, uh, you did this, you're going to hell. It ain't happening. And I'm believing that. 
I trust in that. No, I don't have Jesus standing here saying, he's right. But I'm going to trust it. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. I don't stand before the throne of God yet in judgment. One day I will. But I am trusting. And I'm keeping my eyes on him. And all I can say is that the fruit of my life has been consistent with the word of God. And, and I'm not saying I've made these great strides and I have all this, you know, no more battle. No, I'm still imperfect. But I know, and, and I don't usually look for myself. I usually ask my wife, have you seen change? Oh, believe me. Trust me, Chris. You've changed. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Verse 45 through 48. Then he opened his, their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The first thing that catches my eye as I read these verses right here and right now on this podium is that uh, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed, <laughs> proclaimed in his name, not yours. <laughs> not yours. You must die, that Christ must live, might live. Uh, you must decrease, that he might increase. We're doing this because we love him and he's uh, commissioned us to do. Not because I'm trying to show you how much of a holy roller I am, or how much higher than you I've become in the Lord. One of the beautiful things about uh, being born again is that when that day I went out of my deck and I said, God, I'm back and I'm yours. And he gave me my um, day of Pentecost right there. I mean, just, sh I, I can't even explain. He showered me with his presence and his love and I started speaking in tongues. And, um, and the, but, but that's not even the important part. The important part is that he made me an evangelist that day. He qualified me that day. I had a lot of learning to do, but you couldn't stop me from sharing the gospel that day. That day. I didn't have to wait till I was uh, a master's of theology and got my MD. And, uh, you know. Now I'm learning. And, and there have been times he's made me stop. Does anyone who knows me? heard my testimony, knows there was a time he told me to stop because it was becoming in my name. Mm. I started doing it just to put the notches on my belt. Oh, we're now preaching again on the streets. You know, I used to, down in Oneonta, I would do open-air preaching. I would go to, what was the name of that place we used to go, the school? The tech, the tech school? I don't anyway, we would go there once a week and I would open-air <laughs> preach and, you know, I, and, and I went to the county fair, you know, and, and well, God, huh? You know, there was a name for it, but, um, and then finally God said, I was in prayer one day, and he said, stop. Stop. Whose name are you doing this in? Hmm. This isn't about you getting notoriety. It's about me getting notoriety. It's about me getting souls. Get in your closet and start praying. And that's what I did. But he qualified you today. The day you're saved, you have something to share with others. Now, you should learn. Qualify yourself even more. Christ in his grace provided for us that we would have our minds open to be able to understand the meaning of the scriptures. Christ in his grace has provided. How many times have you remarked, and we just talked about this this week, I forget who I was talking about this with, but about how, you know, before I knew the Lord, I remember when I was doing construction back in the day, and I was like 26 years old, or 25 years old. It was, I was miserable, man. I, in the middle of the winter, I'd be in this condominium complex with the wind whipping through, no heat. And we're on lunch break, and I'd take out my little Gideon pocket New Testament. That's what I used to use. And I'd read the Word of God. I would just read it, you know, and, and I would just read it. And I, I didn't, most of it just went whoosh, right out. And then the day I got saved, I started reading the Bible, and like, Oh, man, I never saw that before. <laughs> check this out. I mean, check this out. What it says here. 
The Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit inside of you teaches you and opens up to you the truths of the Bible that you've never, you've never knew the truths. The, the Holy Spirit opens up the holy eternity, the holy knowledge of God that's in this book. You need the Holy Spirit. I am thoroughly convinced that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not born again. That when we stand before the Lord, that's why He looks at you. He looks at you and He sees right through you. And He goes, I don't know you. Because He has the Holy Spirit, right? And if the Holy Spirit's in you, this is what He's looking for. Do we have that relationship? You know? Well, how do I know, Pastor, I have the Holy Spirit? You don't have to believe, either believe it or not believe it. You ask Him for it. You pray for it. I mean, I, for me, all I can tell you from my experience, when I got the Holy Spirit, it, I got born again. It was radical. Now, some of you don't have that testimony. Some of you have a, a, a slower, gradual kind of thing. But, you know, have you prayed for the Holy Spirit? Ever? Maybe it's a long past time that you do that. But once you have asked for it, He's not going to give you a rock or a fish. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. And then you got to start trusting in that, that He's giving you the Holy Spirit. Now look, if you're not feeling it in your life, then that doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit. It means you got to start praying to the Lord to ask you for more and to cause you to apprehend the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you know what? I hate to say this. You actually have to do some things. You're actually going to have to decide you're going to fight a war and start walking against what it is that... You know, we all know it in our life what it is that holds us back. Drinking, drugs, uh, could be video games, could be uh, the internet, could be Facebook. What's taking up your time? Because that thing that's not of God, that's taking up your time, is what's pulling you away from your relationship with God. It's what's pulling you away from feeling and seeing and hearing from that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who resides in each We have bodies on this earth that are, that are, we have them so that we can use them. You know? I remember uh, when, when, we, when we were living on Long Island, before we got born again, and right up to the time uh, when we got born again, you know, it, even after that, we weren't, we weren't fully getting it. We just kept on accumulating debt. Debt, 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 debt. And then we got to the point where we got involved with Dave Ramsey. School, I don't know what's going on. I think I forget. It's been so long. But and we, we learned how to budget, and we read it how if you don't work, you don't eat in the Bible. So use the Bible, and we learned how you, you have to, um, you know, you can't be a sluggard, you can't be idle. These are all bad things in, in God's economy, and we, you know, so we trusted in the Lord, and then we put our feet to the to the tape, and we did what we needed to do, and we got out of debt. We didn't just sit there and go, I'm just going to trust you, Lord. Yeah. Let's buy that new car. Or whatever. Let me buy those new clothes. You know? We are called, we have physical bodies for a reason. If not, you'd be an egg. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, it's like it's like when, when the, the people of Israel uh, were trying to beat AI in the Old Testament, and one guy had stolen Jericho, he stole some of the uh, idols, I think, the gold, I forget what it was, but he buried them. And he disobeyed God. Because of that, they sent, the AI it was a small town, they're like, how many should we send? Ah, just send 3,000. They went and they got annihilated. Well, they lost 36 people. But that was annihilation. They weren't supposed to lose any. Because they weren't being faithful. So what do they do? They go back, they go, oh, Lord, Lord, I'm trusting in you to give us AI. Oh, Lord. Please help us have AI. We need to have AI. And what does God say? What are you doing? Get off of your feet and do what I told you to do. So one of you has stolen. Find out who it is. That was that specific circumstance. But what is it that you can do in your life to assist you to arrive at where it is you wish you could go? Wish you could be. Practical living. I'm not saying abandon God. I'm not saying not to pray. I'm saying <coughs> there's a symbiotic relationship. 
between God. <coughs> it's a symbiotic relationship between you getting to where you believe the Lord would have you to be and the process of <coughs> God will provide if He calls for you to be faithful. Amen? And here we arrive at the bottom line, brothers and sisters. The most important truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before we go over it, I want to stress that the notion that Christ lived, that he died, and that he rose again, is a historical fact. Did you know that? Historical fact. It's not conjecture. It's not myths. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's truth. Written in history books. Right? Josephus, Jewish historian. Non-Christian. Right? He's a Jew. He wrote about Jesus. He wrote about Jesus' three years in ministry. Right? He wrote about Jesus' faith on the cross. Okay? Uh, in the Bible, you have the uh, testimony. And I'm going to read that to you right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 6. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. There was a mass visitation by Jesus Christ. Most of whom were still alive, though some had fallen asleep. To upgrade that to say we've all fallen asleep, right? Have you ever tried to get over 500 people to agree to promote a lie? Now, in our days of multi level marketing, pyramid schemes, uh, televangelism, you could probably do that, but not to the point where they have to now die for their faith. Not to the point where these liars are now getting put to an arena with lions to get torn to shreds and they're going to keep lying for their faith, for the lie. <coughs> Nobody will do that. People might promulgate a lie. People might try to profit off a lie. But people very, very rarely will die for a lie. Okay? Christ was real. And if you're going to believe that he was real, you have to believe in all that he says he was. And if you're going to believe in all that he says that he was, Old and New Testament, you then got to believe that all that he said is true regarding what the world says that's contrary. Like there are other gods. Like there's more than one way to heaven. Like as long as you're a good person, God will look at that and the scales will weigh on the good side and you'll go to heaven when you die. Nobody will go to heaven to die when they die because they're a good person. Nobody. Mother Teresa has to enter in the same footing that had to enter in the same footing that we would. I don't know if she did. But it's only by grace through through faith, that you were saved. Not to knock the good works. Good works are good. But not when you depend on them to save you. They won't. Because you will ever have that little trail of sin following behind you, the things that you've done. It's like toilet paper on your shoe. You can't get rid of it. You don't even notice it. And then you look at Christ and be like, dude, you got toilet paper on your shoe. I don't care how bright you look trying to look before me right now. The only brightness I see in you is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Nobody dies for a lie. Jesus rose from the dead, and then he ascended into the spiritual realm called heaven. He sits in the very throne room right now of Almighty God on a throne in the full authority of Father God. So here's the most important scripture for you today. Luke 24, 49. It's not what you think. Probably. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power on I. Do you have the power from on high? Yes, he might have rescued you from hell, but do you have the power from on high? Because if you do not, if you are not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you are experiencing only failure in your life, then maybe you need to get into the city and wait for him to give you that power. Maybe it's time to get into your prayer closet for real, to pray for real and say, I'm not leaving here until I know you have touched me in some way 
I don't even know how, what way because I've never experienced it that I will now start walking in the victory that you gave me. Because he provided for it. He already did it. It's already there waiting for you. And I'm not minimizing your experiences. I'm not minimizing your pain. I'm not minimizing what you've gone through. All I'm saying is that we hold on to, it's like a self-righteousness. We hold on to these things like we deserve to, to feel it. Who wants to feel miserable? Who wants to walk in unforgiveness and bitterness and, and hatred and envy and all these stupid things. And he's, he's provided for us on the cross so many. It's done. It was finished 2,000 years ago. Plus, 2017. No, we have to be 2017 minus 32. But I digress. He is sending the promise of his Father upon us. Right? He has sent us the promise of our Father upon us. That is the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Teacher. He's everything. Back in the Old Testament, if you had to be like the king to get that. And then he would take it away if you sinned. You go back and forth. King Saul is the perfect example of that. And then the new covenant comes, and Christ says, Guess what? I got enough for everyone. This would be a point I take two bottles of water. Go for everyone. Yeah. Right? Because that's the truth. That's why the angels would be going, This is enough for everyone. You know? Yeah. That's what we have. That's why our yoke is, is easy and our burden is light. I don't do anything out of a, Oh, God. Yes, the person, uh, now I got to go to Bible study on Wednesday. Uh, no, I don't do any of that. Now, my flesh might be going, dude, no, couch. Couch, baseball's on tonight. No, but I want to be a Bible study. I want to be a prayer. I want to walk with my God. You don't know about Jesus? I want to share Jesus with you. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. I don't know you. I'm scared. How, you might yell at me. You might do this to me. You might do that to me. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Right. Holy Spirit, come on. Right. He's like, I'm ahead of you. <laughs> I'm already working on it. Even if you don't see the results, you trust me. The seed never comes back empty without accomplishing what it was set out to do. Amen. If Jesus never died and rose again, we never could have this gift of grace provided by grace. That's the kicker. You could say, oh, how I wish I was alive and Jesus was alive. Why? You wouldn't have the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't. If he didn't die and rise again and send the Holy Spirit, we'd be worse off than not worse at all. Because now we have access to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we, the veil was torn in two from the top down. You don't die in the Holy of Holies anymore with the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, no salvation. The Holy Spirit in us is the sign which says, He, Josh, is mine. Shakir is mine. Emily is mine. Chris is mine. Well, put your own name. I don't want to mess up anyone's names. <laughs> Brothers, sisters, friends. That day on the cross. That day on the cross when Jesus shouted, it is finished. It wasn't a concession that Satan won anything. It is finished. He declared with a loud voice, it is finished. And Satan's there going, it is finished. Praise me. You thought you'd be me and luck, there's your son. What do we always say? Just because a person insists on his reality, in this case Satan, does not make his reality real at the expense of God's reality. God's reality wins every time. But then after the earthquake, after the thunder, after all these things, and his immediate thought of triumph, Satan had an epiphany. Satan had a revelation. And then I think, you know what happened? When he saw the, the temple, uh, the, the curtain, he knew what it meant that the top-down direction was the tear. He knew what it meant. 
He knew now the Holy of Holies was exposed. And it, he was going, I went. No! He was trapped by Jesus Christ, and Father God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. He was tricked. <laughs> he was played. Like he was always meant to be. Played. And he lost. The second Adam won. For you. For you. For you. I won. In Jesus, Father God provided the legal payment for all sin. In Jesus, Father God provided for reconciliation to himself for all the world. All you have to do is turn back to him, repent, and believe that you're trusting him. In Jesus, Father God provided for immortality with him in joy and peace. I had to put a little uh, expansion on that. Because everybody's immortal. I don't care if you know Jesus or not. You're immortal. It's not a question of your state. It's a question of your geography. Where are you going when you die? You know, I am not one of these guys that says, well, you don't you know, use hell as a reason for people to come to God. Really? Why not? You're going to end up in a place of eternal fire where the worm never dies and fire is never quenched. But we're not going to talk about that. You know, Jesus loves you and he wants to give you a chance. What are you, crazy? The fear of the Lord is something good. If it gets you to the cross... <laughs> And then you come to the cross and you realize he, he never wanted to send you to hell. It's just that that's where you go. There's only you, you have to make a choice. You're either going to go to Father God by His rules, or you're going to go to hell by your own. Hmm. It's where you spend your immortality. That's so very, very important. In Jesus, Father God provided the Holy Spirit to all who would repent and believe. The day of Pentecost marked the first time in history, his story. The first time in all of, create, uh, of earth creation history that the Holy Spirit was given as a part of faith. Because we have his Holy Spirit, God himself, residing in each of us who repent and believe. This is now the temple of God. I don't care if they rebuild the temple in Israel. I don't care if they start doing sacrifices again. I do care. Because that means they're even more deceived. The temple of God is right here. He resides in here. <coughs> we no longer struggle with the wages of sin. We are forgiven. It is finished. No more condemnation by Father God and the child of God. See, you could take what I'm saying and twist it. It is finished. We no longer struggle with the wages of sin. I will no longer walk, you know, I have my eyes on the Lord, I have repented, I'm living for Him, I screw up. I'm going to hell. I go back to Him and I say, Lord, I screwed up again. What do you think He's going to do? Whack, take this and whack you across the face with it? That's what earthly fathers would do. Right? He says, come on, man. Come on. Come on, baby. Come on. I know you can do this. And you watch smile. Legalism says you can't do that. Legalism says you must be perfect. God says, uh, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you know what? Yes! That is where I'm going towards. In my life, I have a daily um, desire to walk in sinlessness. Because I want to please Him. But it, not, the, the idea of going to hell is not part of the equation anymore. The idea of, I must do this, is not part of the equation anymore. The only part of the equation is, this is what he desires. This is what the Ten Commandments say. This is what the law says that, that he desires, the moral law, that I don't steal. And I, I love God with all my heart, my soul, and strength. God, I love you with my heart, soul, and strength. All of you. I want to live with you. There's no condemnation for that. In Jesus, we have the strength of God himself overcome sin. In Jesus, we have the strength in God Himself to overcome poverty. In Jesus, we have strength in God 
uh, from God himself to overcome lust. Just keep on going, man. Pick, it, pick your pet sins. Pick your strongholds. I go after the strongholds first. That's who I am. And while we walk out the victory in our flesh, we're walking it out. We're walking out the victory in our flesh. I may mean, take a few steps forward, a few steps back, a few steps forward, a few, but if with time you will see I am moving forward. Okay? A couple years go by, now I'm over here. Right? That's my life. May that be my life. May I never get to a point as a professing Christian where I just sit down way back here after being here and just saying, Thank God I'm saved. That's like, you know, how do I, this isn't about works, all right? But like, picture your dad or mom, anyone who's had a kid and the, and the baby falls and you're like, you just stay right there. <laughs> stay. One day I'll pick you up and I'll go like this with you. For the rest of your life I'll do this with you. No, that's, that's not how it works. You are being conformed by, uh, from faith to faith image of Jesus Christ. The very image. I remain amazed that anyone can refuse this gift, or that anyone can turn their backs on this gift. Will you? That's the question for you today. Will you? He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ arose in the power of God. The victory is won. Let us walk it out by the grace that he has given us. Amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for rising again. Yes. You are risen indeed. Yes. Father, we love you and praise your holy name. Pastor Mike, riches that the world in the wheelchair. Well, maybe, Lord, you can help him. Or uh, flip or walk, please. Okay. Um, Lord, we put our faith in you, we put our trust in you, we love you. We celebrate this day, Lord. Yes. That the power of God manifests, is fulfilled, and is available to each of us in our lives. That we would live and not die because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.